so that tomorrow morning the, when we begin the prayers, that'll be fresh in our mind, of course. I'm sure everybody here knows the story of Prahlad Maharaja's life. <laughs> but hearing again and hearing again and hearing again is the method of Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is sometimes compared to a to the 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 coolness and the fragrance of sandalwood. Of course, now it's cold out, so the coolness of sandalwood is not so attractive. But when you take sandalwood and you're making sandalwood paste from sandalwood, just by the process of rubbing in a circular motion the, the sandalwood over the stone, the, sto the wood that's otherwise hard becomes soft. I'll need, I won't need those today, tomorrow. You want some light? Okay, make some light. Um, the hard sandalwood becomes softer, eventually a paste, and there's a, a fragrance that comes out of the sandalwood in the form of the sandalwood paste. So similarly, the, the sweetness of Srimad Bhagavatam The juice of Srimad Bhagavatam comes from hearing it again and hearing it again and over and over again. There's a nice section of Chaitanya Charitamrita that um, this painting illustrates. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he was living in Puri, he lived at Gambira at the home of Kashi Mishra. And then early in the morning, every morning, he would go see Lord Jagannath. And after seeing Lord Jagannath, the pujaris would give him some prasad. And he would take that prasad and go visit Haridas Thakur and give the prasad of Lord Jagannath to Haridas Thakur and spend time engaging in Krishna Kata with Haridas. And after spending time with Haridas, he would go to the Tota Gopinath temple. And the at the Tota Gopinath temple, <coughs> he would see the deity, Tota Gopinath, dance and chant ecstatically before the Totodhara deity and sit with Gadadhar Pandit, who was the Tota Gopinath Pujari, and hear Srimad Bhagavatam from him. Chaitanya Charitamrita says, he would hear the entire narration of Dhruva Maharaj and Prahlad Maharaj and when Gadadhar Pandit had finished speaking, he would say, say it again, say it again. And so Gadadhar Pandit would say it again and again and again. So this narration is not something that's new, but it's like the sandalwood, the fragrance comes out by rubbing and the sweetness of the Bhagavatam comes out by hearing and chanting it in discussion, in association of others. This is um, a painting of a painting. It's a reproduction of a painting that was commissioned by Maharaj Prataparudra, 
who is prostrated before the Vaishnavas. And I'll give you the who's who in the picture. This is Gadadhar Pandit reciting Srimad Bhagavatam. Of course, this is Mahaprabhu and Lord Nityananda. This is other, you'll see another painting tomorrow shows he has a lot more hair. It's Advaita Charya, Sarva Bhumabhata Charya, Surup Damadar, there's Haridas Thakur, um, Jagatananda Pandit, Raghunath Das Goswami, and Srivas of the Panchatattva. So the devotees would come together, as you see here, and regularly hear Srimad Bhagavatam recited by Kadadhar Pandit. And hear it again, hear it again, say it again, say it again. So for most of us, it's not new, but we'll explore together and hearing it again and hearing it again. The, the, there's very deep and profound messages what we're mainly going to be covering is chapter 9, starting tomorrow morning. But the whole discussion starts from chapter 5. It spans over several chapters. And <clears throat> we're now going to hear something about the life of Prahlad Maharaj. There's the deity of Prahlad Maharaj in Mayapur during Chandan Yatra, when his, the bodies of the deities are covered in sandalwood. And um, at the beginning, kind of the, the introduction of chapter 6 of Canto 7, Prabhupada writes, can we fix that? No. By accepting the lotus feet of Prahlad Maharaj, who is in the parampara succession, one will be able to understand the mode of spiritual life by accepting this mode of activity. There is no need for material qualifications. So I selected this particular statement because it expresses essences. One of those essences is the life of Prahlad Maharaj is meant to demonstrate material qualification in spiritual life is not a prerequisite for spiritual life. And Prahlad says it again and again and again and again and again and again. It's not based upon material qualification, but it's the mode of activity, as Prabhupada is writing here, or the mode of spiritual life, the mood of submission, the mood of humility, the mood of compassion, and so forth. So we'll learn as we go through all of this about the, the mode of spiritual life. So the story, this is now taking directly from Prabhupada's writings, uh, the language, once upon a time. When the four sons of Lord Brahma, pictured here, named Sanaka, Sanandana, Sanatana, and Sanatkumar, were wandering throughout the world, they came by chance to Vishnu Loka. So, we know that Lord Brahma is the first born living being. And after creating the universe, he wanted to fill up the universe. And so he has the power from his own body. He exercised the power to generate offspring. The first born were the four Kumaras. <laughs> they were requested by Lord Brahma to assist him in creating Praja population to fill the universe and they declined. 
They wished to instead to remain brahmachari, and so they did. And they're four. They're all the, so they're the oldest, next oldest to Lord Brahma, but their form was always that of a small child, five or six years of age child. Uh, clothed by the four directions, wa wandering naked. And the way the Bhagavatam describes this is just like a little child, they're free to go anywhere, anywhere, they're not restricted. And they had the power, so they were going anywhere, everywhere without restriction. And the purpose of going from one place to another place is sometimes because you want something, but you watch the behavior, Prabhupada speaks like this, you watch the behavior of little children and it's hard to understand the reason from going from one place to another place, but they go here and they go there and no one restricts them. And similarly, just by chance, they came one time to all the way to the abode of Vaikuntha. They had such power. And uh, although these four Kumaras were older than any of other of Brahma's praja within this universe, they still remained very small. When they got to the gates of Vaikuntha, the gatekeepers, Jain Vijay, thought, these are little children, they can't come in, they'll make a mess. So they stopped them. And when they stopped them, the four sages were fully enlightened and they became agitated. And they spoke, you're unqualified to be gatekeepers of Vaikuntha. Specifically, Prabhupada is saying here, agitated by the material qualities of passion and ignorance, you're not fit to live at the shelter of Madhudvisa's lotus feet. which are free from such modes. It would be better for you to go immediately to the material world and take your birth in a family of most sinful asuras. Now, that's a fast forward because they, they had some choices. But I want to spend a little bit of time on this word madhudvisa, as you see it's highlighted. Because they're... they're Although they're little boys, looking like little boys, they're highly learned and they're at the gates of Vaikuntha and they know there is this history of <clears throat> Lord Vishnu killing the Madhu demon. So one of the names that we know Krishna by is Madhu Sudana. Sudana is he kills like Keshi Sudana, Madhu Sudana, Sudana. He's the killer of the Keshi demon, he's the killer of the Madhu demon. But another name of Krishna is this one, or another name of Vishnu is Madhu Dvisa. <laughs> and Dvisa or Dvisha comes from the word envy or to have envy, like Dvesha, Raga Dvesha. Same root word. Having ill feeling towards or having specifically envy. So Prabhupada named one of his disciples Madhudvisa. He's no longer with us, but wonderful devotee that was um, GBC in Australia for a long, long time. Very trusted leader in, in Prabhupada's group of leaders. And one time in a sitting in the room together with Prabhupada, he asked Prabhupada, what's the meaning of my name? And Prabhupada said, Madhu means the demon Madhu, and Dvisha means having envy. And Prabhupada said, Lord Vishnu had envy towards the demon Madhu, so he killed him. And Madhu Dvisha said, but Prabhupada, how could Vishnu have envy towards anyone? And Prabhupada's reply was, no, no. Not the material kind of envy, but 
in the pure state, because everything, these aren't his words, but everything is within Krishna. Say it in reverse. Is there something that exists that's not within Krishna? Now there's the contaminated version of things, and then there's the pure version of things. But the contaminated version or the reflection version is there because of the pure version. So Prabhupada said, anything is possible for Krishna. Any emotion in its perfect form. So we'll see this again tomorrow morning, this word dvisha. When Lord Dashringadev is angry, even after having killed Hiranyakashipu, he's still angry. And that anger has arisen from, he has disdain, transcendental, for those who are trying to harm his devotee. So here, the four Kumaras, nice painting. There, one of them is pointing to Jai or Vijay, saying, you're not fit to be in the kingdom of Madhu Dvisha, who is free from all modes. So there it is. He's free from all modes, but he has envy towards Madhu. So it's not a contaminated kind. Interesting, huh? They're, they're, the four Kumaras are um, Shaktyavesh avatars. It means they're living entities that bear the fullness of the Lord's potency in a particular regard, and theirs is Jnana Shakti. They're f as full as the Lord is full in knowledge potency. So they know all these things. So they're purposefully saying to Jai and Vijay, this is the kingdom of Madhu Dvisha, who is free from the modes of nature, but you two obviously have the modes of nature infested in your character, so you don't belong here. Here's a another illustration showing they're coming to the gates of Vaikuntha and the gatekeepers stop them from entering with their clubs. So Jai and Vijay, they're very apologetic because of their offenses at the feet of devotees. Two attendants of the Lord, Jai and Vijay, became Hiranyakashipu and Hiranyaksha in Satya Yuga, Ravana and Kumbhakarna in the next Yuga, Treta Yuga and Shishupal and Dantavakra at the end of Dwarpa Yuga. They were cursed to take birth as demons for three lifetimes. So when this was going on, uh, Lord Vishnu came, or Narayana came to the gate and the four Kumaras, they're not just Ghanis now, they're, they're Shuddha Bhaktas, and they're very interested in the Lord's lotus feet. Here's a painting showing them uh, moving about the realm of Vaikuntha, looking quite different than the other residents of Vaikuntha. Uh, here's a painting showing Lord Vishnu with the goddess of fortune and uh, the Kumaras are down here, Jai and Vijay are over here, they're all paying their respects to Lord Narayana. So they were cursed to come into the material world and they immediately fell into the material world. And when they took birth, the Bhagavatam says, the whole earth trembled. When, when demons are born, 
there is inauspiciousness on earth. I'll just share this. One time we were in um, coming back from Harinam Sankirtan in our Sankirtan van, crossing over the Manhattan Bridge into Brooklyn. And it was, we're coming back for lunch. It was the middle part of the day, full, you know, bright, sunny summer day. And all of a sudden, the sky became black, almost like night. There was still some light from the sun coming, but it just... Suddenly, for about eight, nine or so minutes, very, very dark. And then all of a sudden, it cleared. And I just took it, some demon just took birth somewhere in, in Brooklyn and these signs of inauspiciousness, just like the Bhagavatam says. So of the two brothers, here's a lovely picture of Hiranyaksha. Um, he was assisting his brother because they both have the Hiranya part of their name, which means they were very fond of gold. And so he was excavating so much gold from the earth that the planet earth fell out of its orbit and plunged into the Garbhadak Ocean at the bottom of the universe. So Lord Brahma, contemplating what to do about this Hiranyaksha and the problem of the earth, because he's the creator of the universe, and everyone looks to him for taking care of these cosmic problems. So he was contemplating what to do, and as he was contemplating from his nostril, a very small creature the size of a thumb looking like a boar came from his nostril and then went into the air and expanded and it became bigger and bigger and bigger. So big, it looked to be like the size of an elephant. Giant elephant in the sky. Lord Varaha. And then this Lord Varaha knew exactly what to do. He plunged into the Garbhadak Ocean with his tusks. He started lifting the earth, and when lifting the earth from the depths of the water, Hiranyaksha came and challenged him. And a big battle ensued. Guess who won? Lord Varaha finally finished Hiranyaksha and um, returned the earth back to its position in orbit. Of course, the demigods were very pleased, but the brother of Hiranyaksha was very angry and He took a vow, very angry vow, that he would avenge the death of his brother by killing the person who killed his brother, Lord Vishnu, who became the avowed enemy of Lord Vishnu. So in the course of time, he, as he became more and more powerful, he wanted not only power to rule the universe, but now he wanted to rule the universe permanently. He wanted to be Indra forever. So he went uh, to the forest and he underwent a very severe type of austerity. Of course, doing for a little while is not so difficult. You stand on your toes and hold your hands over your head. You can do it for a little while. But, you know, besides getting tiring. Anyway, he was doing this with such intensity that flames were coming out of his head and the whole universe 
was becoming choked up and very, very distressed. But he stood there, and a whole anthill formed around his body. So the way that Prabhupada describes this, here's a, another image of Hiranyakashipu doing his austerity. Um, Lord Brahma was waiting for that austerity to become ripe. And meanwhile, while Hiranyakashipu had left his kingdom to do this austerity, the demons didn't have that same leader, so they scattered here and there. The demigods took the opportunity to invade and take over the kingdom that Hiranyakashipu had left empty. And Hiranyakashipu's wife, Kayado, at that time was pregnant. And so the, the demigods were going to arrest her and wait till the child was born and kill the child. But fortunately, Narada knew exactly what to do at exactly the right time and say exactly the right thing. And he explained to them, no, no, this isn't a demon. This is a, a great devotee. So you please entrust this great devotee to me, and uh, I'll take care of him and her. So Narada Muni brought Kayadu to his ashram. There's a place where some ladies would stay, and she asked for a benediction that uh, the child would not be born until Hiranyakashipu returned from his austerities. And Narada gave his benediction for that to happen. And meanwhile, also gave her spiritual teachings. And not only he gave it to her, but to the child within her womb. Um, Prahlad, still within the womb of Kayadu, Prabhupada writes that he was listening very carefully. Now, I don't know what children are listening very carefully. Certainly there's spiritual benefit from hearing. Um, even if the child isn't very, 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 very special like Prahlad. We'll hear at the very end who was Prahlad in his previous life. The Bhagavatam has one version and we'll hear. So. While uh, this was going on, Narada instructing Kayadu and Prahlad, Hirani Kashipu's austerities had become mature. Lord Brahma came and said, what is it you want? You're disturbing the whole universe. You're doing this very severe austerity. I want immortality. So what he did is he, whoops, he sprinkled some water from his kamandalu and the anthill washed away, and the body of Hiranyakashipu that had been reduced to bones became full again, and youthful and nice looking. Hiranyakashipu was so severe and so skilled that although his body was gone, his life air was circulating through the hollow of his bones. He was an intense personality. So when Brahma said, well, I can't give you immortality because I'm not immortal myself. And so he played an intelligent manipulation. I can't give me an immortality then. Range that I cannot be killed at, during the day or at night or inside or outside or on the ground or in the sky. and can't be killed by any created being, nor any weapon, nor any animal, nor human being. Ravana left out the human being part, but Randikashipu didn't. So the boon was granted, and Randikashipu went back to his palace, 
Kayadu then gave birth, and Prahlad grew up as an ardent devotee of Vishnu. But that's not what his father wanted. His father wanted to be an anti-Vishnu or, a, you know, a demon like himself. So <clears throat> he was entrusted in the school of his spiritual master. And the spiritual master of the the spiritual master of the demons is who? Shukracharya. And Shukracharya had two sons, and those two sons, Shanda and Amarka. And so they went to Asurakula. And they tried to train Prahlad how to become an Asura. But he wasn't interested in becoming an Asura. He was just interested in being a devotee. So one day, his father, Hiranyakashipu, brought Prahlad to see him and had him seated on his lap very affectionately and asked him, what's the best thing that you've learned and Prahlad said, the best thing I've learned is that people like you who are absorbed in material consciousness of duality, thinking I and mine, they should just give that up and go to the forest and worship Vishnu. His father didn't want to hear that at all. And he challenged the teachers. Someone has polluted this boy and they said, no, no, we've been very vigilant. No one's been around. So you better watch it. You go back and make sure he learns how to become an Asura. So they made their best effort, but Prahlad wasn't a, a fit recipient for, for all of those teachings. Then one day, this is just simply narration of the story of Prahlad. One day, when the teachers were out of the classroom, he, they wanted to play, but he wanted to talk about Krishna. So he had them, there's a whole chapter on his instructions to his classmates. And at the end of that instruction, they had kirtan. And the boys really liked kirtan. They hadn't been taught kirtan by Shanda and Amarka. And in the midst of the kirtan, in come the school teachers and, what's going on? Where'd you learn this? So they reported this to Ranikashipu. And again, Ranikashipu brought his son forward and inquired, what's the best thing you learned from your teachers? And he didn't learn from the teachers, he learned it from Narada and described the nine process of devotional service famous section of the Bhagavatam. It's an important section. <laughs> so, Hranikashipu had it. He just became extremely angry. Vishnu, devotional service to Vishnu, he's the enemy. So the teachers were chastised and he ordered that Pallad should be killed. Not a nice father. So, uh, in different, different ways, <coughs> attempts were made to kill Prahlad, putting him in a den of snakes and tossing him off a cliff and having wild elephants stampede him. There's another with a pit of snakes in a circle of fire, in a pot of boiling oil. Nothing worked. He tried and he he did his everything, all of his dirty things that he knew how to do and nothing worked. There's the elephant again. Blood, and instead of being at the bottom on the elephant's foot, he ended up on the head of the elephant. There's this pot of boiling oil. So Aranyakashipu was so angry. 
I'm the most powerful person in the universe. Everyone's afraid of me. But you're not afraid of me. Where do you get your fearlessness? Lord Vishnu. Oh. Where is this Vishnu? He's everywhere. Then Hiranyakashipu said, this is now Prabhupada. Oh, most unfortunate Prahlad, you have always described the Supreme Being other than me. A Supreme Being who is above everything, who is the controller of everyone, who is all-pervading. Where is he? If he is everywhere, then why is he not present before me in this pillar? Of course, we normally hear it a little differently, but that's in one place Prabhupada describes like that. So... We also normally hear he struck the pillar with his sword. Here it's he struck the pillar with his fist. And there's Lord Shingadev. And the way Prabhupada writes it, to prove that the Supreme Lord is present everywhere, even within the pillar of an assembly hall, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Hari, exhibited a wonderful form never before seen. We'll hear something more about this never before seen because it's in the beginning, tomorrow morning. Lakshmi says, I never, you know, she never saw this form before. The form was to uphold the words of Brahma, neither man nor beast, so it's half man, half beast. The Lord appeared in the assembly hall, big battle between the two, guess who won? Lord Nishingadev captured Hiranyakashipu, placed him on his lap, supported him with his thighs, not inside, not outside, not in the air, not on the land, but on his lap, and easily bifurcated the midsection of Hiranyakashipu. That was the end of Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu, the cursing of the first two of the cursing of Jain Vijay. And after Hiranyakashipu was killed, the soldiers and generals and associates of Hiranyakashipu went to take revenge, and Lord Nishingadev manifested many more arms and roaring very loudly and chopping the bodies and throwing them through the air and big scene. The demigods very pleased because Hiranyakashipu had become so powerful and was big terrorist. And after Hiranyakashipu was killed, the Lord was very angry. So there's still roaring and showing anger. So there's a whole chapter of the demigods offering prayers, beautiful prayers, glorification of the Supreme Lord. He wasn't becoming pacified. So finally, Lord Brahma requested Prahlad. He appeared for you, to protect you. So... You can pacify him. Please, you go forward. And Prahlad wasn't afraid. He was, the Bhagavatam describes, he was confident that anger is not for us. It's for the demons. And so he came before Lord Nishingadev to offer some very beautiful prayers. Now, this is where we leads this into tomorrow morning where the prayers begin. Lord Nishingade placed his hand or his paw on the head of Prahlad. Immediately, this is Prabhupada's language, immediately he achieved Brahma Gyan, spiritual knowledge. And in that state of spiritual knowledge, remember he's just a little boy, 
he has full spiritual knowledge and he offers prayers filled with spiritual knowledge and filled with devotional ecstasy. Now, Prahlad, because he's a devotee, he understood uh, here we go. He understood that the Lord wanted to give him an addiction. Uh, but Prahlad didn't want to take any benediction, thinking benedictions, it's going to be a problem in my spiritual path. Finally, he requested the benediction that I not be asked to take any benedictions that will impede my bhakti. Down at the bottom. He said that if the Lord wanted to give him benediction, he wanted the Lord to assure him that he would never be induced to take any benedictions for the sake of material desires. There's this, so this is not what we'll be discussing. It's, the, it's chapter 10. We're going to be discussing chapter 9. But in chapter 10, he says, our, our relationship is, uh, you're the master, and I'm the servant, and there's nothing else. The relationship is not, you give me, and I want from you. That's business. But our, the, any master that does like that, he's not a good master. And any servant that serves his master with some purpose to achieve from the master, he's not a good servant. That's not our relationship. It's just one thing. You're the master, I'm the servant, nothing else. <laughs> So the, the Lord gave him the benediction that he would rule in the material world for the duration of one whole manu <coughs> duration, and then he would come to the spiritual world. But in the course of that service to the Supreme Lord, he had become fully purified through the process of bhakti yoga. and then to teach others this process of bhakti yoga in his role as a king. So Prahlad's a devotee, and he just accepted whatever the Lord arranged for him. He asked for his father to be delivered, but Lord Nishingadev said he's already delivered. In fact, not only he's already delivered, but when one becomes a devotee like you, 21 generations in both directions, are liberated. Then he was asked by his father, excuse me, asked by Lord Nishingadev to perform the funeral for his father, and they embraced one another. Very beautiful painting. So now, tomorrow we'll begin chapter 9, where the, the, the prayers of Prahlad begin, the prayers to Lord Nishringadev at the request of Lord Brahma. There's a nice photo of the deity of Lord Nishringadev in Nubrindavan, right? And the deity of Lord Nishringadev in Sridham Mayapur. Now, there are two versions of who was Prahlad Maharaj in his previous life because he was recognized by Narada still within the womb of his mother that he's a, he's a great devotee. So who was he before he was in the womb of his mother? And why did he, if he's such a great personality, why did he t take birth as the son of Hiranyakashipu? He's not a nice person. So the Bhagavatam, Prahlad Maharaj says, this is chapter 10, Oh, my worshipable Lord, because 
the seed of lust and desire, which is the root cause of material existence, is within the core of everyone's heart. You have sent me to this material world to exhibit the symptoms of a pure devotee. Indirectly meaning he's a Vaikunthavasi who was sent by the Supreme Lord to teach pure devotional service. So it's similar to what Prabhupada said in that introduction to chapter 6, to teach us the way, the mode of pure devotional service. That was the Supreme Lord's intention, and he fulfilled that intention. Now, in Hari Bhakti Vilas, which is another reference that we accept as uh, source material, here is a different description. Now, that just means, you know, different appearance of Hiranyakashipu and Lord Nishringadev and Prahlad, just a different yuga cycle arrangement like that. So here's what it says in Hari Bhakti Vilas. Prahlad is asking the Supreme Lord, Nishingadev, I, I bow down to you, O oh, Lord Nishingadev. I offer my obeisances. I'm your devotee, O oh, Lord of Lords. I now have this inquiry from you. How did I develop such intense devotion for you? Kindly tell me. How did I become your exalted devotee? Of course, by hearing from Narada, but even before that, Narada knew he was a great devotee. Whoops. Lord Nishingadev said, Oh, greatly learned one, oh my son, listen carefully as I explain to you the reason for your devotion to me that has made you very dear to me. In ancient times, you were born as a brahmana, but you did not study any scripture. Your name was Vasudev, and you became attached to a prostitute. In that birth, you became so attached to that prostitute that you didn't do any pious activities except one single vow in relation to me. So... We'll hear about that. As a result of observing that vow, you developed exalted devotion for me. Due to being attached to a prostitute, you became accustomed to drinking wine and performing other sinful activities so that you never engaged in the study of the Vedas. You spent most of your time at the house of the prostitute. Sounds like a Jamila. One day, however, you had a quarrel with the prostitute. And because of that quarrel, you fasted. And it doesn't say it here, but it was an Akadasi day and he fasted. You observed a sacred vow. So the sacred vow was observing fasting on Akadasi. It wasn't intentional, he just had a quarrel with his girlfriend. Because of that quarrel, you didn't stay together that night, and she also didn't eat anything. She observed near Jalakadasi, the same, same as you. And because of observing that vow throughout the whole day and night, you both became purified, and pious credit came to you for that. So <clears throat> on the strength of observing this vow, the demigods are able to enjoy their lives in the heavenly planets <clears throat> Brahma created this very auspicious day, like an ecodicy. So, Prahlad, by having observed that by accident, that auspicious vow, you now have come to the position of devotional service. In her next life, the prostitute became an apsara and then went back to Godhead. And you became the son of Hiranyaksha, excuse me, Hiranyakashipu and Kayadu, and you're going to be a, my devotee for this life and then also go back to the spiritual world. 
In order to propagate devotional service to me, you have incarnated without me. After completing the task of preaching the glories of devotional service, you will again enter my eternal abode. So some nice paintings. This is um, Narada and the benefit that Prahlad will hear in his prayers, the importance that he places in having had the good fortune of Narada's association and hankering for more and more and more of Narada's association because in Narada's association he can learn the ways of devotional service and serve Lord Nishingadev better. So just circle back again and say, these two sections, Prahlad Maharaj's story and Dhruva Maharaj's story, they're very well known, very famous, and they're famous and well known because what's within them is very important. Now, in the case of Dhruva, we hear the story of someone going from very materially motivated purpose of reaching Vishnu to the position of purity in devotion, unmixed devotion. And Prahlad, the no material qualification element of Prahlad, the compassion of Prahlad, the absolute, abject, no material interest in the life of Prahlad, he gives, we'll hear in his prayers, he gives reasons why he has that position. Well, he says, I, I saw my father. He had everything. And in a second, it was all gone. I'm not so foolish to get try to get some of what he had, and then in a second, it's all gone. No, thank you. Very, in very intelligent and very detached and very attached to the Supreme Lord. Now, the, the, the stage of perfection of Prahlad, we find this from Nectar of Devotion, that his perfection was always remembering and coming up uh, for our New Year's event that we're going to be conducting in Chicago. That's going to be the theme, always remember Krishna, never forget Krishna, because that's the purpose behind all the regulations mentioned in Nectar Devotion. Just this one thing, always remember Krishna, never forget Krishna. And Prahlad had, had that. He taught the way. Now, one who has that always remember Krishna capacity doesn't mean it's always going to be nice. It'll never be cold. It'll never be too hot. You'll always have friends and never have any enemies. It's always going to be, you know, as you want it to be and never as you don't want it to be. So that, that's not, there's hardship and difficulty. And what is, but it's not that hardship and difficulty doesn't drive away, steal away remembrance of Krishna. It's an impetus for strengthening one's remembrance of Krishna if you're on the right platform. And if you're not on the right platform, then you can get on the right platform or else suffer. And we don't like to suffer, so better to get on the right platform. That's his... So he's showing us the standard of always remembering the Supreme Personality of Godhead in any situation. And, and we will see, 
in his prayers, <clears throat> uh, the kinds of feelings he has towards his father, towards Lord Dashingadev, towards people of this world. We heard a little bit about by his classmates. He just has affection for others. There's these three things in the in the life of a exalted devotee like Prahlad. Three things. They want devotional service. They want the association of devotees. Because in the association of devotees, they'll hear about the Supreme Lord and in hearing about the Supreme Lord, they're, they'll be very happy. They want that association of devotees. And they want a friendly regard for all living entities, even the inimical personalities. They want friendly regard towards all living entities. There's several nice sections because well, we could say one. I'll say one of them. There's several nice sections in the Bhagavatam where the personality of Godhead offers someone who's dear to him, his devotee, whatever he would like, any benediction he would like. And these three things are mentioned. I would like always to be engaged in your devotional service. Here's... Here's one of those examples. <clears throat> when Krishna left Vrindavan and was brought to Mathura by Akura, um, as he was entering into Mathura, uh, he had different encounters. He met the washerman. It was first he, it was it was deity worship. He first he took his bath in the river Jamuna. And then he had to have suitable clothing for entering into Mathura, so the, the encounter with the washerman. And then the encounter with Kubja, you know, sandalwood paste and fragrant oil. And then the weaver to give some ornaments. And then finally, the flower garland. Deity worship. But, but interacting with people instead of only just a pujari. So when it came to the florist, the florist was expecting him. He had saved the best, best, best flowers. And the description, it's not in the Bhagavatam, but it's in Garga Samhita. <laughs> the florist, because his occupation is making flower garlands and having flowers to sell, so he was always on the lookout for where's good places to get flowers. And he heard in Vrindavan they have some really nice flowers. And Vrindavan isn't so far from Mathura. So he ventured into Vrindavan, and one day he saw Krishna. And like many people that lived in Mathura, they'd heard about Krishna, and they had some attraction for Krishna. Some became devotees of Krishna. But the florist saw Krishna, and he was was so attracted to Krishna. So he regularly went to Vrindavan hoping, will I again see Krishna? Will I again see, where is Krishna? Where is Krishna? So when he heard that Krishna had come to Matra, he had gathered the very best, 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 best flowers. He had two. The way that it's described is Krishna saw one of them hanging on the wall. Krishna didn't say anything. He just looked at and the florist knew Krishna knows and Krishna wants the garland so he was it was just a loving exchange and he garlanded Krishna and Krishna said you you pleased me so much by your devotion. You can ask any benediction you'd like. She said I, I don't need anything. I'm just being in your service, that's everything. So if you want me to take a benediction, lifetime after lifetime, let me just be engaged in your service. 
And let me always have the association of your devotees, and let me always have a friendly disposition towards all living entities. And there's another, there's other examples like that. It's, it's a, a theme. So Prahlad didn't specifically ask for those things, but that, those are characteristics of Prahlad. He wants simply to, to be always in service to the Supreme Lord, always remembering him. That was his service of the nine types of devotional service. And other forms, so the Lord wants him to be the king and rule the world and teach devotional service. The association of devotees, in, in his particular case, it's Narada. But others who are exalted devotees of the Lord and have have regard. He has such regard for other living entities. We'll hear. But he I, I don't want to leave and go to the spiritual world, leaving behind all of these people who are suffering and unnecessarily. Please take them to We'll hear some more tomorrow morning. Paradukha Duki is he's such a he, quality, incredible compassion, and um, profound in his knowledge <clears throat> of the personality of Godhead and the process of devotional service and how to give the process of devotional service to others. His spiritual master is superlatively expert, Narada Muni. And fearless. Fearless. Teaching devotional service and having kirtan in Harani Kashipu's school. Ooh. Fearless. Speaking to his father the way that he spoke to his father. Fearless. Not foolish. Fearless. So we'll learn a lot. If we listen carefully, I'll make my best effort to share the, the mood, because it's what Prabhupada said, the mood of serving the Supreme Lord. He's teaching the way of the proper mood of serving the Supreme Lord. So we'll try to touch on that as we go along with his prayers, chapter 9. So any discussion? Questions? Lights? Oh. Vera Budger, you're going to get the light and then take the microphone, right? So can you take the microphone around? <coughs> Comments or questions? Anyone? Yes? Back. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, in the Prahlad Maharaj's previous life, one of the scenario where... Prahlad uh, Maharaj does what? Prahlad Maharaj's previous life. In his previous life. Uh, the Ekadasi fasting uh, unintentionally and without having any consciousness to please Krishna or Narasimhadev, even then he got the benefit. So I was wondering, is just exception or... Uh, because I always worried that I don't have good intention and right consciousness in doing any devotional activity. So is this... How should we take this? What's your question? What's the... How do we understand that? If you don't even know what you're doing, you get benefit anyway. How do we understand that? Yeah, still we can. Certainly, with proper intention, benefit is even greater. But even not knowing the benefit is very great. So 
Terry Bhaktivila. So, I mean, your question is, how is it so? Let's take one of one of the examples that strikes me very much in nectar devotion is people who see the cart of Lord Jagannath and stand and appreciate. They manifest forearm forms of Vishnu. Now, I've seen lots of Rathiyatras, and I've never seen people manifest forearm Vishnu forms. <laughs> <clears throat> and, you know, what they're eating and drinking and smoking and doing and speaking and, can, you know, they're, what, how they're... So they're, be, they're contaminated and they're quickly covered. But it, So it's not that that's an exaggeration. It means the potency is there. So this is an example where the potency... Even he wasn't properly situated, didn't know what he was doing. He just had a fight with his girlfriend. It's powerful. As far as I understand that, this little narration is to illustrate no, what, the, the power of a codice. Now, as... Rupa Goswami has done in Nectar Devotion. He makes statements, and then there's scriptural references that illustrate and support that statement. So similarly in Hari Bhakti Vilas, there's statements, and then there's scriptural support for that statement. So the, the power of a codice is very special. I don't know where that scriptural reference comes from, but it's in, quoted in Hari Bhakti Vilas. So that's just the, the authenticity of the statement. The, the message is very powerful, even unknowingly. Devotional service, agyata sukriti. And yes, in no, doing so knowingly and purposely and intentionally, all the better. Does that answer your question? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, Maharaj. Hold it a little further away because there's feedback uh, in the microphone. Maharaj, my question is like um, many times I've asked this and I've pounded upon it like when... Uh, Could you Dev hold the microphone a little further away because there's feedback? Go ahead. Point? Keep going. Yeah. So like when he gives the benediction of like 21 generations being yes. liberated. Yes. Uh, so does it like mean actual liberation or they get a chance? It's actual liberation. And now what kind of liberation? Yes. Uh, <laughs> Prabhupada gave the answer to that question by saying they will have the opportunity for devotional service. Because devotional service, he didn't add this, but devotional service is from the liberated platform. Brahma Boyaya Kalpate. That's Prabhupada's answer. They will have the opportunity for devotional service in their next life. Because bhakti is voluntary. So they can say, no, I don't want to go to Vaikuntha. I want to party. But they'll have the opportunity, at least, that kind. We don't want party goers in Vaikuntha. They will. Okay? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Um, I had a question about uh, the pure state of envy because I'm not quite sure I even understand what a pure state of envious, if envious is uh, believing that the grass is greener on the other side, right? Krishna, Vishnu is, is all grass, right? All sides. So what, is, what could he be envious of if it's, if it's all from him? Well, if I've understood your question correctly, the difficulty to understand <coughs> is due to the, the, the frame of reference or the lens or the definition of what envy is. 
Because when we're envious, it implies certain things. But the point that Prabhupada was making, it's, I, I purposely brought it up, because it's going to come up tomorrow morning also. I mean purposely. Because it's one of these very interesting things. Within, is, Krishna is the source of everything. This world is a reflection of the spiritual world. It's a distorted reflection. It's perverted, distorted reflection. But within Krishna is everything. Otherwise, even this place doesn't have an existence. This, this place is a reflection of him. Now, within him, there are feelings. In a pure state. The problem in, you know, how do I understand Krishna has this feeling, is we're thinking it's feelings like we have. Mm. But it's not like that. It's the pure state, and ours is a distorted, perverted reflection of the pure state. We'll, we'll touch on it tomorrow. But so, what, why was he angry? Or what would... Because Madhu, in this case of Madhu Dvisa, Madhu had stolen the Vedas. Madhu and Kaitaba. And what were they going to do with it? They were going to do terrorist stuff. Bad for the everybody and everything. He was angry. Brahma was scared. Lord Vishnu was angry and he killed them. So, now that's a feeling. Wait a minute. You're supposed to be peaceful in the spiritual world. Why are, you, why are you doing stuff like that? Because we're thinking with the lens of... Mm -hmm. so it's a transcendental. And then it spills over to, we're going to hear tomorrow, to the devotee. You know, these things are enemies. But there's a place for those things, even for a devotee, to be angry. We'll hear it tomorrow morning. But it's connecting to, to this one. Whatever is there in the spiritual world is pure and uncontaminated. And this is a reflection of that that's impure and contaminated. What does that feeling feel like? We won't know until we become pure and uncontaminated. But we should know within Krishna is everything in its pure state. I mean, I could go on with this, but it's be a little arduous. Something else? Yes? Yeah. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Um, this is in my mind from last two, three weeks. Uh, we have three, four examples. One is Dhruva Maharaj, one is Prahlad Maharaj, one is Narad Muni, where they only had seen Lord once and they got purified. Then we have two examples. One is Dhridvira, another one we recently talked about, Kekai where they were in the association of the Lord, but then also because of the, maybe later on, because of the bad association, yeah, bad they were association. against the Lord. But why doesn't this, this doesn't work out that sometime with the Lord, one gets purified instantly, and maybe being in the service of the Lord, then also they get impacted and... Well, there's, there's, there's not a hard and fast rule that you can say, this is it. There's complexity, and there's, you know, there's, we, within that complexity of everyone, everyone's situ our, your situation, their situation, our situation, there's complexity. 
Now, within that complexity, there's principles that are operating. Just, you know, taking Kai K. She had defects. She was stubborn, and with you know, without the, the she was um, not a worldly person. She wasn't able to th understand the consequences of what she was saying and doing. She actually she had low feelings, although she had you know she had exalted feelings. She also had some low feelings. That is. If Ram becomes king, then Kaikei is going to be favored instead of me being favored because I'm younger and more beautiful and the favorite of the king. But that's going to change if Ram becomes. So it was, you know, the worldly kind of envy. Then I'll have to become the maidservant of Koshalya, forget it. And worst of all, my son, Bharata, she, she, she got covered by dirt, dirty thoughts through mantras association. Now, <clears throat> step back from all of that, and there was a plan, a transcendental plan, that Ram would leave and go kill Ravana. And she, Kaikei, was an instrument of that plan. And mantra was an instrument to help that plan. So, who can understand all that stuff? Well, Krishna understands all that stuff because it's his plan. We can't always understand all that stuff because we're not Krishna. So there's, there's variables and ultimately there's the five factors to action and ultimately there's the Supreme Lord who sanctions everything. So we're not, we may, you, I, we may not be able to sort out why in this case and that that case, you know, another case, something else happens. There's, there's many variables and ultimately the Supreme Lord's plan. In the case of these exalted devotees, it's Leela. Because there's something else that's being taught in the course of all of this. And one of those things, and specific with Kaikei, is watch out for bad association. Even you may be very dear to the Lord and hold the Lord very dear to you. Watch out for bad association. And people that get in your ear and say bad things. Watch out. It's very powerful. Very, 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 very powerful. She became covered. Later, she regretted. She realized what happened. But, you know, so each situation is a little different. There's, there's a purpose of, of this. Ultimately, the purpose of the Supreme Lord to help guide us in how to reach him. In Drova's case, how to go beyond material desire, and etc. Narada in his previous life, how to go beyond loss of shelter. It could have, it could have been traumatized, but instead he became exalted. And that, that was the, the, the source of that was the mercy of the Bhaktivedanta. Anyway, so in each case, there's lessons. And where do we take shelter? You know, most important for us out of all of this that at the end of the day is where's our shelter? For Pallad, it was Narada. It wasn't, you know, what he was in his previous life in the the highest vow that he did. It was Narada. It was Narada. Because people may have unintentionally do something exalted and not end up like Prahlad. It's Narada. Okay? <coughs> Thank you. Shravan, yeah? Behind you. Thank you, Shri Guru Maharaj. Uh, is there any difference between uh, spiritual envy and the material envy, Maharaj? Of course. One's pure and the other's impure. 
what is the impurest, we're at the center, and we, we want to everything to be, we're at the center. Mm. When it's not. It's, it's like, not identical, but it's like competition, and transcendental competition is, Prabhupada points to the gopis. They want to see Krishna's pleasure, and if one gopi is pleasing Krishna very much, that makes them pleased because Krishna is being pleased very much. But in order to increase Krishna's pleasure even more, they have transcendental competition who can please Krishna more. And then there's the material kind. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah. Okay, so we'll end. And uh, tomorrow morning, I spent a lot of time, besides preparing, just I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to structure 13 classes and the material that we have to cover. I really struggled with it. So t tomorrow morning, um, get some good rest tonight because we're going to have a, a really long session tomorrow morning because it just, I couldn't break it up. It was just, it's meant to go together. The first seven verses are leading up to the prayers that start with number eight. So I just, it didn't make sense to break it. it, it there's a lot. And it's important because it sets the mood for the prayers that will begin after breakfast in the, the second session tomorrow. So that I'm just letting you know, it's particularly long. And not, they're, all not, they're not all going to be that long. I'm just warning you, it's going to be long and important. So be prepared. And towards the very end, I also, on Sunday, there's a, another long section. The others are kind of about the same. And the foundation is important. So that's part of the reason for this. The, the life of Prahlad, and then the mood of Prahlad as he enters into prayer, and then his prayers. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai.